how many times do you like hear something that you really needed to hear in that moment or like came across a podcast that you really needed to hear what they were talking about because you're going through that same exact situation as a person on the podcast you know stuff like that is like hmm are we in a simulation <laughs> even thinking like when I first seen you I'm like wait you're my roommate yeah, I remember you came up to me <laughs> I'm like class. this is Karen <laughs> I'm gonna put a picture of Karen and I know Karen listens Karen this is you in a few Hi, years Karen. this is you a in a different universe <laughs> mind over matter is magic I do magic Mind over matter is magic I do magic Welcome to Mind Over Matter, baby. I'm your host, Deja Wallace, and if this is your first time joining me, welcome. If this is not your first time joining me, welcome back. I appreciate you. You real, you loyal. Shout out to you. Like, you came back for another episode of Mind Over Matter. And I have a very special guest on today's episode, on this week's episode of Mind Over Matter podcast. I'm, in, I'm joined with educator, director creative just all around multifaceted very talented professor of mine professor sally thank you for joining me taking the time out to come onto the podcast i appreciate you thank you so much that was the best intro i've ever had <laughs> uh, i tried i tried i tried um so honestly i can say like you are one of like my favorite prof professors I'm not trying to, like, ride her. I'm not, like, relax. You guys, like, if you had her as a professor and you go to Brooklyn College, you know what I mean. She's, like, so compassionate. You're so understanding. Like, you're, like, really the best. I know on the evalu evaluation papers you got, like, straight five stars, honestly, <laughs> because no flaws here. Um, Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. I need to give my flowers while the person is here and I get to give them their flowers, you know? A lot of students probably feel like that, but they wouldn't say it out loud, you know? I completely understand. Yeah. yeah. But thank you. It's really nice to hear feedback because I, I always try to make classes, like, as fun and as um, fulfilling for students as mm -hmm. possible. So yeah. I'm glad it worked out for you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it did, it did, it did. <laughs> Was that, like... I don't know, was that, like, are you new to teaching? Because you look really young, honestly. <laughs> I know, it has some advantages to it, but, uh -huh. um, no, I've been teaching for uh, five years now, I believe. I know it's not it's not that long, and I only teach at Brooklyn College as an adjunct professor, okay. uh, but my goal is to get tenure, like, as I get better as a director, so I can mm -hmm. bring more to the table. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would say I have some experience teaching, but I always approach it like, what can I bring to the table? Because I know I'm never going to know everything. So mm -hmm. how can I make it fun and more of a playful and safe space for students to yeah. experiment? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I felt that while I was there, it wasn't it didn't feel boring. Like a lot of these teachers, I'm sleeping with my eyes open. <laughs> like I didn't know it was possible, but yeah. On today's episode, we will be talking about film because you are a director. Yeah. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into simulation theory. We're getting into like subliminal messaging and how film is made, like overall, the root of, rule of thirds. If you know, you know, like all my film heads, you know what the rule of thirds is, but it's just basically how films are put together visually. So we're going to talk about all of that on episode 58 of Mind Over Matter, baby. <laughs> so kick back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Okay, where do we start? Where do we begin? Uh, let's see. I want to start with, like, social media. How do you feel like going from just the, the horizontal, like, way of viewing film to mm -hmm. vertical viewing has changed? And well, has that changed the way people consume and how the director like even produces the film mm -hmm. for people to consume 
You know, that's a very interesting question because I feel like we're still in the transitional stage where I would say I still gravitate towards the old school horizontal framing, but mm -hmm. since I am present on social media and I do post on social media uh, and I work for uh, a media company as an editor, um, I can see that organizations around the world are kind of adapting to this new aspect ratio. And for me, the, the biggest change that I've seen is when you go to the vertical format, you kind of are cropping out the background, right? So I see videos being more centered on the individual or the character themselves, which I find, find really interesting. And I personally love the horizontal more because I feel like it gives more context to the frame. You know, I feel like it's it's much harder to get like a wide shot or like an establishing shot in the vertical space. Um, so I'm very aware of that transition. And uh, I'm actually about to produce the first like very small web series that will be entirely shot vertically. So it's really interesting mm. to think about that in a vertical format. That's so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to see how that comes out. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Because a lot of the times I would have like a horizontal um something I shot landscape mode mm -hmm. on my phone and I try to like put it on Instagram Reels or something like that forces me to put it vertically mm -hmm. and like it just crops everything and zooms everything in. and like you said it takes away from the background and like the scenery and I feel like that feeds into why we have well my generation I feel like have shorter attention spans mm -hmm. we're only focused on the subject and like okay, how good does this subject look? We're not really looking up at, like, everything that, that, um, the scenery around it. And it forces, like, even, like, actresses or, like, social media, like, creators to basically be cogn cognizant of what they are putting up. And then now they're trying to be more, like, you know, like, lustful or more like sexual to bring that person into them like visually instead of their background Absolutely. i feel like that can be like detrimental to yeah. your mental health i feel like with the eight second rule you know there's an eight second attention span where you mm -hmm. either grab the audience's attention or they scroll um yeah, I feel like it's important to get straight to the point, which kind of takes away uh, a little bit from like the traditional art of filmmaking where you set up the scene or you set up the story. I feel like when you deal with the portrait mode, you have to jump straight to the point. <laughs> so I, I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I miss those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what have you, do you think there's any like positive things that can come from changing like the film world to more vertical kind of just consumption absolutely i feel like you know embracing change is always hard but at the same time it we always adapt like as humans we always find a way to adapt so i am personally very fascinated with how it's going to keep developing and how filmmakers are going to figure out how to tell impactful stories in portrait mode mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know how do you feel about it i like i said i'm kind of like skeptical about it i feel like it's making creatives less creative in a mm. way yeah um I think we have to simplify or like dumb down our messaging because we don't have enough time and enough space to even get that message out. But how are you like being, knowing all of this, how are you like being intentional when you're putting out this um, vertical short film you're putting out? I think it com comes back to getting uh, right to the substance of the video. So for example, uh, I work for Big Think. It's like a big um, educational slash entertainment media company. So I edit interviews with uh, physicists, philosophers, psychologists, and the interviews are usually much longer, you know, like 10 to 15 minutes. And one of my tasks is uh, after editing the full piece, I have to create social clips, you know, clips that would go on YouTube shorts mm -hmm. or Instagram reels. So it's kind of been a, a struggle, but also a very interesting challenge to figure out if I only have one minute to grab someone's attention, 
like what part of the interview would I cut out <laughs> for the audience to see and hopefully to be attracted to watch the full piece. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I never I just can't see the good in this because like even when you're cutting out like a piece of like a very deep intellectual conversation you're not gonna have context and then that comes with like this kind of clickbaity kind of mm -hmm. generation that they just want to see the thumbnail they just want to see the highlight they don't want to listen to everything in its entirety and make their own you know thought about it <laughs> yeah you know honestly being on social media myself, I've noticed that it's become harder for me to watch like traditional movies. And I know mm. it's, it's kind of embarrassing to say as a filmmaker, but uh, I realized that I kind of have to train myself to do that. So I, you know, used to force myself at first, just like sit down and watch a two hour movie. But I think with practice, your brain kind of adapts and gets more comfortable with diving deeper into the context of any conversation or a story. So I think it's a matter of practice, but I'm also, I don't know how you feel about it. I feel like for me, vertical video has not really replaced like the full format that we're used to. Uh, I understand that social media is a huge part of our lives, but I do believe that for stories that truly touch people, people still seek them in other places, maybe like YouTube or a movie theater or streaming mm -hmm. platforms. So I don't know whether that's going to switch to the vertical format necessarily, but mm -hmm. I see it more as an interesting experiment for shorter form content. Right, yeah. right. Because um, I don't think it will switch over completely, but I think that some aspects of social media, even when I watch like certain movies, I watched a movie called Missing the other day, mm -hmm. and the whole movie was of her on her phone, like through the like the point of view of her through her iCloud and her uh, on her laptop, like it was like the point of view of her camera on mm -hmm. her yeah on her um laptop, and it was very like interesting to watch, but it was like okay. I can see, like, aspects of, like, our reality getting into, like, the film world. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of the film Unfriended. It's like a horror oh, film. Oh, yes. It's similar to yeah, that. Yeah, it was fully done through, like, I don't remember. It was, like, a Zoom screen or some type. Yeah. Just, like, a laptop screen. It was just, like, that concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, You should watch Missing if you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's, I will it's check really it out. interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think it will fully replace it neither, but it's just an interesting like idea to see happen and unfold while we're alive. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, we're going to get into simulation theory. I'm just going right. to jump right into let's it. Let's do it. I thought I could like ease my way into it, but I'm like, let's just get right yeah. into it. I don't see the bridge either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like g good segues, but this one, we just got to rip the bandage let's off. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um... Do you know what simulation theory is and what is it to you if you do know what it is? Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm not an expert, mm -hmm. you know, like super hot fire sink, but I'm not a rapper. <laughs> 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 but in my understanding, um, simulation theory implies that there is a higher civilization out there that's running simulations on many different computers. And basically, we are just one of the computers running the code and we're living according to the algorithm oh damn oh i didn't know that was <laughs> that's <laughs> my, i have a whole different understanding really of, what is your understanding i look at it as a more spiritual kind of um guide as like this whole world can be basically conduced into like num numerology astrology and genetics like we're all connected through those three things Interesting. and that's what governs the world um, I do hear people say like this computerized thing, but I think that's kind of like us, us trying to understand it, like, mm. like a simpleton trying to understand mm. it. But I think it's way bigger than us. And like, we're all on this grid that's connected. Mm. Yeah, that's the best way I can put it. But, um, I think that just like everyone reality is like connected in a weird way by our experiences. And we all have like, of course, we all have our individual experiences, but these experiences are like, we get these, ex these experiences happen to us because of what we think. And that's what mind over matter is at the end mm. of the day. Yeah. I see. That's yeah. a 
That's a very different understanding of the simulation theory. Yeah. yeah. I, I put a lot of thought into this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what is like your favorite simulation theory movie? For those who don't even understand what I'm saying, sounds like mm. jibber jabber to them. Yeah. <laughs> what was what's like your favorite example to like bring up to people to explain what that is? You know, I think the most like traditional examples that we can look at are like movies like The Matrix or Inception. Mm-hmm. But to me, uh, the latest simulation theory movie has been um, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert. That movie was just too much for me. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> but I think I think it was meant to be a lot because yeah. the idea is so much bigger than us, you know, that... Yeah our lives kind of stretch across multiple uni- universes. I, of mm-hmm. course, I don't necessarily believe in it, but it was interesting to see that even if we live in a simulation and even if there are other like algorithm, algorithms or programs running out there where different species or different people or different mm-hmm. versions of us are living their own version yeah. <laughs> of their lives, I still feel like for me, it's very important to stay grounded and my life and how I create mm-hmm. le- meaning in my own life mm-hmm. um, but you know it's actually interesting because um, I knew we were going to discuss simulation theory so I thought it would be an interesting experiment to live throughout this past week with the mindset that I do live in a simulation and see how That's my trippy. perception would change <laughs> and you know um, <laughs> For example, the other day I had an interview that I was directing and the subject didn't turn out to be as well-spoken as I was hoping. Mm -hmm. It was very different from our pre-interview and just throughout the interview I was realizing like, damn, I'm, I'm not getting anything like useful out of this interview and, you know, if I was in a different mindset, it would give me a lot of anxiety because... Obviously, I want to get a good final result. I want to have a good interview with the person. I, f- I felt like I couldn't connect. But when I remembered your topic, I was like, okay, so if we are in a simulation right now, then it's more like a code where, okay, so Sally doesn't get a good interview right now. Like, it's just mm-hmm. it's just not happening for her. So, you know, like that code branch, like if then, you mm-hmm. know, so like if she doesn't get a good interview, what is she going to do next? And it kind of took the anxiety out of it because it made That's it feel more like a program rather than something that I do. Interesting. Give, like, and you said you don't believe in it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You might have a believer, guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Like, in a nutshell, it's like one experience connects to, like, your experience. Mm. You know, it's like a paradox in a way. But, like, even, like, if I randomly open a book and, like, I was in that mind state, like, oh, we're in a simulation. Everything I read on that page will, like, re- resonate with what I'm going through. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it could be trippy if you, like, think think too deep into it but like I feel like there's some truth to it not everything entirely entirely like oh this universe is going on like somewhere I'm 500 pounds you know on TLC as my 500 pound life can I have a bowl a little bowl of fruit loops and I have (laughs) two like no I don't think like (laughs) there's different versions of me because I can't prove it. I don't know. Yeah. You know? But Neil deGrasse Tyson did, like, unwind, like, he un, um, he debunked this theory. And it kind of made sense. But I can't explain it the way he explained it. But I think there's some truth to it. Because a lot of the times, how many times do you, like, hear something that you really needed to hear in that moment? Or, like, came across a podcast that you really needed to hear what they were talking about. Because you're going through that same exact situation as a person on the podcast you know stuff like that is like hmm are we in a simulation <laughs> even thinking like when I first seen you I'm like wait you're my roommate yeah, I remember you came up to me <laughs> I'm like class. this is Karen <laughs> I'm gonna put a picture of Karen and I know Karen listens Karen this is you in a few Hi, years Karen. this is you a- in a different universe <laughs> Yeah, but, like, how it has to be some truth to it, you know? Mm. You know, I feel like if you look at it that way, then you can say that life in general is a simulation. Because for me, the most fascinating thing is how we came to be, like, scientifically. The fact that 
the earth, so many things had to go right and, you know, randomly right on earth for us uh, to be able to habitate it. So I see it as the entire universe is a simulation where it's all different patterns and like random algorithms kind of running and somewhere it ends up in, you know, life, somewhere it doesn't, but it always produces all these different results. So mm -hmm. I guess if you look at it that way, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of does, just yeah. a little. Yeah. My, I would say my favorite simulation theory, I have two of them. Let's do it. Simulation theory movies and shows. One of the, the movie is The Truman Show. Mm, classic. That, <laughs> that will like really make you understand like simulation theory is like, have you ever felt like, I don't know, I'm, I'm weird. <laughs> no, why? How so? <laughs> like, have you ever felt like, okay, this was too perfect like having like a deja vu moment absolutely and that's i'm that. like yeah it feels like a glitch in the simulation when mm. you have those moments it's like wait i experienced this before and i feel like i've seen this before too or i felt this same kind of like event happening and it happened again yeah and it's hard to explain but like i know i experienced this before like even if it's something little like it's just like a split second of a moment and it's like, wait, are we in a civilization? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, The Truman Show is the best movie, I feel like, that explains it. Mm -hmm. The show, I would say The Rugrats. The Rugrats? Yeah. Yes. You, you so? You watched The Rugrats. Yes. I, I mean, I was born and raised in Moscow, Russia, so oh, I used to I watch Rugrats, that. like, dubbed. And I used oh. to have uh, Angelica. Uh -huh. like a doll, yeah, yeah. Uh, like eating a cookie, and every time you would feed her a cookie, like mm -hmm. her mouth would actually get dirty as a toy. I don't know. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> but can you what? tell me, can you, <laughs> can you tell me how that show is related to simulation theory? Because I feel like that's going to blow my childhood mind right now. <laughs> because like, the beginning of the show always starts off with them like getting into some mischief, like um, Chucky, you know, losing his rocket ship, and then he goes on this whole adventure in space just to get back his rocket ship. But at the end of the movie, the veil is, like, lifted, and then he's not really in space. He's in his garage or something, right? I see. So in his head as a child, like, all these, ch Tommy, all of them, they really believe in their head that they're going on a mission to space. But the parents are looking at them like, all right, they're kids. They're just like, they're imagining this. Mm. But you cannot convince these children that they didn't just go to space. I see. Yeah. My mind is blown right now. Yeah, but the parents really believe, like, these are kids. That's their imagination. And they didn't go to space. They were just in the garage. So it's like, who was wrong and who was right? Because we're watching it from, like, you know, from a viewer standpoint and... We've se we've seen the kids go to space, so yeah. it's like, wait, how wild is a kid's imagination? And how, like, it's back to what I said in the beginning. It's like, what you believe is your reality, mm. you know? That makes sense, because I feel like as kids, we're still learning the boundaries of reality. So I, I can definitely see how kids would genuinely believe that they went on an adventure like that. But that's, it's also interesting to think about because you can bring that to your adult life as well, like you said, and you can make your own reality, right? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> um, A book that talks about simulation theory well is The Alchemist. You ever read, read that? I love The Alchemist. Yeah, I love The yeah. Alchemist. So I'm reading again for like the fourth time. Nice. Yeah, but that book talks about like simulation theory through like spirituality mm -hmm. kind of like how the world aligns and you see all these omens that they call it in the book or yes. like like confirmation that you are like doing the right thing mm. and your mind, body, and soul is aligned to get where you want to be. Mm. Yeah. I hope I didn't lose anybody. <laughs> <laughs> are you still in this simulation with us right now? <laughs> right. It's a paradox. Like It's, it's really a paradox. Yeah. But, um... Even when I think of, like, the Truman Show, that movie, I think about, like, 
the actors in that movie. And I'm I'm like, are you okay? Because <laughs> even when I look at Jim Carrey now, he's like kind of off the walls when we look mm. at him and he kind of like rambles a lot. Mm. And a lot of people can't understand when he speaks. Mm. And it's like, are you okay? Because a lot of these actors, they take on the role of their character to a degree where they can't come back from it. Mm. So what do you think the implication of like acting come that comes with acting when you do get far into this role? You know, I feel like it depends on the style of acting mm-hmm. that the actor is practicing. I would say when you talk about people who find it hard to come back from the role, that makes me think of method actors, like people who truly dive into their character. And even in their everyday lives while filming, they might be living as their character. So I can mm. see how it might be hard to come back. You know, one, I think one of the like darkest examples I can think of is Heath Ledger. Uh, you know, he... He sounds away. familiar. Yes, he uh, passed oh. away after playing Joker in The Dark Knight. Oh, and yeah. it's not it's not confirmed, but, you know, there are conspiracy theories or at least rumors out there that that role was so, was so out there and so hard to grasp and live through. And, you know, he was a method a- actor, so I could see how it must have put him in a very different and probably dark mindset throughout filming that it was so hard to come back from it but I work with different actors and I would say if you just transform into your role when it's time to record then I don't see people having a hard time coming back to who they Mm -hmm. are like originally yeah but when it comes to method acting yeah I can see how that can be a transformative experience because you're literally living as someone else Mm. I have another example, too. Um, Lakeith Stanfield, he played, um, he was in the movie Judas and the Black Messiah. I don't know if you ever heard of that movie. I haven't watched it. Yeah, but his role in that movie, he played the character where he had to um, basically, it was like the Black Panthers movement, and Mm -hmm. he was um, a part of the movement, but he was basically the rat in the movement that um, snitched on every the Black Panthers and went to the CIA and told Mm. them what was going on. on, And he even got like, um, he was basically giving intel on what the Black Panthers were doing and giving it back to the CIA. And he said like psychologically that movie messed him up and he had to go to um, therapy after. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know if it's, I feel like every good actor has to go and live out that character to some degree. Absolutely. Even, like, I know this is random. Um, Will Smith, when he slapped um, Chris Chris Rock, Rock. right? I feel like, did you watch his most recent movie before that? No, what was his most recent movie? It was um, the movie with Serena Williams, and he was playing the father, King Richard. Oh, no, I haven't watched it, but I heard good things about that Yeah, it was a... Great movie, but his character would do something like that. <laughs> you Interesting. Know? Like that, like fits his character. His character was going around slapping people in the face. <laughs> like, mm. so it's like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like in acting, you have to be able to like snap out of it, like you said, because even like, um, you watch Goodwill Hunting, yes. Robert, yes. Robin. Robin Williams? Yes, Robin Williams. Yeah. yeah, he even, like, went through some dark times because his characters played that at times. Mm, yeah. That's very interesting. I feel like when we talk about, um, like, I, I don't know how to say it, like, A-grade actors like that, I think mm-hmm. it's also important to take into account the aspect of fame mm. because I, I think that sometimes it might be hard for them to come back to their ordinary selves especially when people around them, not in their immediate circle, of course, but people that see them on the street or they interact with in everyday lives, they might see them more as like the characters they've Mm. played rather than the people that they are. They probably don't even know their real name. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They approach them like, hey, you from the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be contributing to the fact that they're, you know. Yeah. That's what's interesting to me. Even like sometimes I feel like movies are kind of close to reality even though they're Mm. um exaggerated i feel like you have to like 
tap into some parts of reality to even like produce something. And even like I feel like sometimes movies can like foreshadow events. Like even Sim the Simpsons, they have a lot of theories about the Simpsons <laughs> foreshadowing events and even predicting events. And do you believe like um movies have the or like not even movies, directors or whoever writes the movies mm -hmm. have the capability of like predicting something or like foreshadowing something that already happened? Mm. That's an interesting question. And I think my initial answer is no. Like, you mm -hmm. can't really predict what's going to happen. So if it happens, it might be more of a coincidence. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, filmmakers, our job is to reflect on our lives. And a lot of the times you can't see where things are happening, where things are going and what's going to happen. You know, it's kind of like economists or historians. Like, if you study history, you can kind of tell where where things might go so I think when it comes to film if the filmmaker is really into researching the topic and they understand the movement within the topic I do think that it's possible to possibly foreshadow reality mm -hmm. <laughs> through the film what do you think I've seen this time and time again like films I don't even know if it's called foreshadowing if they made the film before something happened. I don't know if it's a coincidence. Like I said, we're in a simulation, okay? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Are filmmakers capable of creating films outside of their real life experiences with accuracy? Mm. You know, that's something that I've been changing my mind about for years as I keep working in the film industry, but um, you know, when when you study at film school, one of the first things that they tell you in any screenwriting class is to write what you know. And at first, I didn't really understand the rule. But with years, I realized that what it means is if you truly want to reflect on something realistically, like on a character, if you want to portray someone truthfully, if you if you want to create a a full picture of a person or a situation, that's something that you should live through because of course you wouldn't really understand the life of someone that you know if you haven't literally like walked in their shoes and um I at first thought that I don't know at first I, I was kind of skeptical of that rule I kind of felt we're all humans and like if I understand you or if I understand the the script and the character then I can make it realistic and mm -hmm. I think the <laughs> The very first examples were where it showed me that it's not true was one of the first short films that I directed straight out of uh, grad school. Uh, so I was hired to direct this film, uh, and it was about this couple who would role play to spice things up, and they would role play like they don't really know each other, and they, they meet each other as strangers, and they kind of cheat on one another with one another. And I remember that the producer at the time was very set on finding a female director. So when they found me, they were like, oh, that's great. You know, you're a woman. You understand what she's going through and how she wants to spice things up. And I thought I really did. But I, I watched that film couple, a couple months ago, and I realized that I really didn't know what that character was going through. Because, you know, when I was directing it, I was like 22 years old. I had never been in a long-term relationship. I had never been in a situation where I did want to spice things up with my long-term partner. So I just the fact that I was a woman was not really enough to portray the character the way she deserved to be portrayed. And I think that experience gave me the understanding that if I if I want to tell a story of something that's not personally relatable to me, I have to do a lot of research. And I don't know, I'm just like thinking off the cuff right now, but um, it reminds me of like the white savior movie genre, you know, where it's like, it's usually white filmmakers that try to tell the story of black characters without really understanding the complexity and like how could they because like they would never be able to live that life 
And and on top of that, not just that it's not portrayed realistically, but more than that, it's like the the white character that tends to be the main character, you know, kind of like saves everyone else. And I just find it so fascinating that it emerged as a genre and kind of, and kind of stayed on the scene for many, many years before people really started uh, questioning it. But I do think that that's one of the examples when people who have nothing to do or they don't really have not just the right to to like say something on that topic but just they just go ahead and they express themselves without really understanding the complexity of the character I do see it as an issue because then you know film is a reflection of reality and I think to make something impa impactful you have to put in the time into research and really just finding out more about someone's story and so yeah, I, I don't think you can write something impactful if you're just writing it because you're interested in it without giving it more thought or, you know, or energy experience or experience. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you feel about it? Um, I agree. Um, I feel like you have to go through something to actually have like the experience and the accuracy. That's really what it is, the accuracy of because even like when I think about the white savior complex, they don't know the experience and they probably don't even have any black friends. So they can't really produce a film with accuracy and they get away. A lot of white filmmakers get away with it a lot. Um, Even like a film that was what was it called? It was a Mar the Marilyn Monroe story documentary mm -hmm. on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch it because. <laughs> I heard that it was produced from the point of view of a white male mm. and she was very like over sexualized mm. in the film I heard and she was like they made her very promiscuous and made seem made, made it seem as if she was like asking for it. You know how like some men they say like okay, if you didn't want the attention why are you dressed like that? Yes. That's the kind of like vibe the film gave and I didn't I, like I'm not interested in watching mm. that. Yeah. Even like um the Jeffrey Dahmer movie, I can't watch that neither because like I heard it kind of I seen um trailer clips of it and it looked like they glorified Jeffrey mm. Dahmer and I'm like like what what intention this, did this filmmaker have with producing something that glorifies somebody that's a cannibal? You know? So stuff like that is like, I feel like somebody will have to experience that or be like close knitted with it to actually produce it with accuracy. And I feel like intention is behind everything. If you're poorly informed on a subject, that's going to show in the film. And your biases will come up in the film. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, um, 40 minutes, I'm going to close off soon. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, How's it going so far? With what? <laughs> with the <laughs> simulation. Oh, with the simulation? Yeah. I mean, I believe it, so yeah. you guys don't have to believe it. I yeah. believe it. Is there any conspiracy theories you believe? No. No? I'm very skeptical when it comes to conspiracy theories. Nothing? <laughs> nothing. Nothing that comes to mind, really. Really? Are there any conspiracy theories that you believe? A lot. Almost all of them. Really? Uh, can you give me <laughs> one example? Maybe I'm forgetting something. Um, I believe in the Illuminati. I don't think it's called the Illuminati, but mm. I believe in it. I believe in... Um, I don't believe the Earth is flat. No, mm. I don't believe that. Like, come on. I believe... <laughs> come on, people. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> Get a better hobby. Um, um, I believe in simulation theory. Like, you can't mm. convince me that's not real. Um, Do you think simulation theory is a conspiracy theory? In a way, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because if I say that out loud to my mother, she's going to look at me like, huh? <laughs> like, if th that's the reaction you get from most people, I feel like that's a conspiracy theory. Interesting. Yeah. I feel I'm not gonna say some because I might lose some viewers. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna save those for another time. Um, aliens are real. Um, yeah, UFOs are real. Um, 
I do believe in aliens, but not the way they've been portrayed necessarily. I just believe that there ha there is definitely some sort of life out there. It may not be. We probably can't imagine what it's like because, mm -hmm. like you know, like we were discussing, you can't really make something up that you haven't exactly. like seen or experienced. Mm -hmm. So, but I do believe that there is a life out there. But I feel like sometimes you just know because. Like I believe in God, but I can't mm. see, and I can, and I can't. Um, I haven't seen him, mm -hmm. but I just know it's real mm. because of my like certain things in life that I went through. I'm like, okay, that had to be God. Mm. Certain things, I know aliens are real for a fact. I know it. I just know it in my heart, in my soul. I don't know what they look like, yeah, but I just know they're real. Yeah. Um. What else do I believe in? <laughs> <laughs> you should do an episode on pure conspiracy theories. Yes, <laughs> yes I should. Um, is there any last thing you would like to say and let the world know? I don't <laughs> <laughs> Take two. Yeah. It's okay. We have time. Um... I don't know what do people usually say here. <laughs> <laughs> they probably they usually put their Instagram and their plugs and like where to follow them, oh, and what I they're see. doing currently. I see. Thank yeah. you. Well, um, I want to say thank you for having me of on your course. podcast. It's my first podcast, so Yay. I was very nervous but excited. <laughs> um, I'm working on a new short film, Pure Face. Uh, we will be going into production in June, so I'm really looking forward to that. I would say it's the first story that I wrote that's truly personal, so I'm very mm. excited to bring it to life. And uh, you can find me on Instagram under Sally Lomi. Yes, yeah. we love it. And check out her short film. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm excited to see that, too, your next project. Yes. I'm going to be tuned in. Where can I watch it? Well, we haven't filmed it yet, so we're in pre-production. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But you okay. can, you know, I'm um, I'm sharing the journey of what it's like to create a short film. So if you're mm -hmm. interested in seeing how the process goes, then, yeah, check it out on Instagram. Yay, yeah. we love that. Okay, and that's another episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making it to the end. I hope you have a beautiful day, a beautiful week, a beautiful life. <laughs> Make sure you tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend mother that it's mind over matter, baby.